Honorable Senators, I rise to speak to the third reading of Bill C-7, the Trudeau government's bill to expand assisted suicide. Bill C-7 marks a profound shift in Canada's assisted suicide regime. Five years ago, Bill C-14 established a system of medical assistance in dying or MAID that would hasten the deaths of people already at or very near their deaths. Bill C-7 will now expand the criteria for access to include those for whom de death is not reasonably foreseeable. Medical assistance in dying will no longer mean assisting a death which is already underway. Instead, it will mean the state terminating the life of a person who might have otherwise have had years of life remaining. This expansion could unleash an ethical Pandora's box, and I especially fear the devastating impact it will have on the lives of vulnerable Canadians. It is regrettable that the Trudeau government has chosen this moment in time to push legislation that will expand assisted dying in the midst of a pandemic when anxiety, suicidality and substance use have increased at the same time as services and treatment options have significantly decreased or even vanished. We are in a time when people are alone, isolated, economically disadvantaged, and this is the Trudeau government's priority piece of legislation. It's disgraceful. Throughout the study of this bill, we have heard repeatedly what academics and professors and constitutional lawyers theorize about expanding assisted suicide, what it will mean in a courtroom or a lecture hall or at the next professional conference. But what has been less prominent in this debate, honourable senators, are the voices of the people who have the most to lose from this legislation. People living with disabilities or struggling with mental illness. Indigenous peoples, black and racialized Canadians. Canadians who are isolated or living in poverty. Honourable senators, those people who have been routinely pushed to the margins of our society are crying out to us for help. But they don't want help to die, they want help to live. One of our most important roles as senators is to represent the views of minorities in the democratic process. We are to give voice to the voiceless so that no one is left behind. But with Bill C-7, the Trudeau government has left so many Canadians behind. Honourable senators, it is our duty from our privileged position here in the Senate to ensure that we actually listen to all the voices the federal government has ignored with this legislation. We heard from many of them during our legal committee studies on this bill. People living with disabilities, like John Jonathan Marchand. Jonathan has muscular dystrophy and lives in a long-term care facility in Quebec, an institution he likens to a medical prison. Last week, he told us, quote, just like Jean Truchon, I'm forced to live here because there is no support to live in the community. My disability is not the cause of my suffering, but rather the lack of adequate support, accessibility, and the discrimination I endure every day. Suicide prevention is offered to people without disabilities, but I deserve assisted suicide? I've been told before, if you're not satisfied with what you've been offered, why not accept euthanasia? My life is worth living. I want to be free, quote. Studies have shown that recipients of MAID in Canada have a higher income and are substantially less likely to reside in an institution than the general population. Advocates of assisted suicide cite this as evidence that MAID isn't being accessed by vulnerable populations. But Dr. Sonu Gain told our committee that would likely change if MAID is expanded to include those for whom death is not reasonably foreseeable, and especially for those patients suffering from mental illness. He said, quote, in North America, there is an equal gender balance and those seeking MAID tend to be better off, well-educated and also Caucasian. That is when MAID is for those who are dying. People who have lived well want to die well. Evidence shows it is a different group who seek MAID for mental illness, with twice as many women as men in those situations seeking MAID and patients suffering from unresolved psychosocial stressors, quote. Mental health advocate Mark Hennick, who himself struggled with treatment-resistant depression, testified at our legal committee that he absolutely would have access to assisted suicide had it been made available to him at his lowest point. He expressed his concern that MAID was not really an equal choice for suffering from mental, severe mental illness, who often feel as if there are no other options. He told us, quote, the suffering was so grievous that I couldn't see anything outside of it. The way mental illness works is that it collapses around you and puts blinders on you, so that even if there are other options, you can't always see them, quote.
Mark pleaded with our legal committee to retain the exclusion of sole mental illness in Bill C-7, saying, quote, I'm asking you as a mental health advocate and as a person with lived experience of both serious mental illness and recovery, please don't do this. Don't abdicate your responsibility to better care for the most vulnerable among us under a false premise of freedom or a misapplication of what equity really means. Medical assistance in dying solely for a mental illness, assisted suicide by a sanitized name, will set the mental health recovery movement back by a generation." Quote. The debate over Bill C-7 has seemingly coalesced around two polarizing worldviews, one of privilege and one of need. The debate over the choice of assisted suicide seems ludicrous from the perspective of someone living on the margins, unable to access other options for the treatment of intolerable suffering. From that viewpoint, it understandably seems to be a luxury to create a plan in advance to die with dignity, when most of one's energy as a marginalized person is directed toward the struggle of just getting by. As author Nora um, Loretto recently wrote, quote, this perspective imagines that a dignified life is attainable in Canada for everyone, and that someone should have the right to decide when in their path along illness they want to die. But for everyone who can't access that dignified life due to ableism, capitalism, colonialism, and or racism, the conversation is an insult." Quote. Bill C-7 leaves people behind uh, living in poverty, like Gabrielle Peters. On the right to seek death on one's own terms, she told our committee, quote, the phrase on their own terms is slightly foreign to me as a disabled poor person. I can't even cross the street at 8,000 of the 27,000 corners in Canada's third largest city because they have not been ramped. I live in a unit that was assigned to me. On the day I moved in, the movers had to wait while the police, then the coroner, and then an ambulance used the elevator because this is how people here move out, quote. Disability advocate and community organizer Sarah Jama argued that factors of class and poverty mean that not all choice is created equal in the face of the very final act of assisted suicide. Further, she suggested that by expanding access to MAID so that more upper middle class Canadians can choose to arrange a peaceful or beautiful death, a whole other group of people, those living with disabilities and poverty, are exposed to significant harm. Quote, Across this country, disabled people are living with government-sanctioned poverty rates on social assistance and without properly funded medication or therapy. What does choice truly look like under these conditions? A choice for some that would extinguish the choice of others is unjust." Quote. After Gabrielle Peters appeared at our committee, she mused about the irony on social media. Quote, the state causes suffering through its policies, refuses to enact policies that would end or mitigate the suffering, and then kindly offers to pay to end it, and you, permanently, quote. Sarah Jama pointed out how the parliamentary discussion on expanding assisted suicide in Bill C-7 has been shaped by the lack of diverse voices at the table, particularly when it comes to socioeconomic class, quote. I also think it's quite obvious that there has been a lack of diversity around people's income and class. A lot of the speakers that you've heard from, from Dying With Dignity, have been people of an upper middle class background and have lobbying support, support with networks, and family and friends to support pushing this bill. You've not done enough work to go and talk with people who are living in poverty or to people who are living on social assistance. The two views are quite different in terms of what this means, in terms of the medical racism and medical ableism that these groups face." Quote. Many Indigenous witnesses mentioned high-profile cases of racism in the healthcare system, including the horrendous racist treatment of Indigenous patient Joyce Eshaquan and Brian Sinclair, an Indigenous man with disabilities who died in an emergency waiting room after being ignored for 34 hours. Several witnesses feared that opening the eligibility criteria for MAID to persons not at end of life would mean an increased risk of coercion for Indigenous patients. Neil Belanger of the British Columbia Aboriginal Network on Disability expressed his view that, quote, racism toward Indigenous people permeates through our health care system, and it would be dangerously naive to suggest that MAID would be exempt from this system failure and to suggest that Indigenous persons living with disabilities would be adequately protected without the end-of-life criteria under MAID, quote. The federal government's Bill C-7 has left Indigenous peoples behind. Many Indigenous witnesses at our legal committee hearings commented on the Trudeau government's lack of consultation with Indigenous peoples, particularly Inuit and Métis, on the issue of assisted dying. 
Dr. Kerry Barassa reiterated the need for comprehensive consultations with Indigenous communities in a spirit of meaningful cooperation, stating, quote, if we're going to have this discussion, it has to be done in a very delicate manner. You can't just pull together three or four elders and expect that to be engagement, quote. Tyler White of Siksika First Nation called the government's consultation with Indigenous communities grossly inadequate and voiced his concern about the message expanded assisted suicide would send to his community's young people. Quote, we are concerned about the impacts of Bill C-7 on our efforts to combat the youth suicide crisis in our communities. The expansion of MAID sends a contradictory message that some individuals should receive suicide assistance while others suicide prevention. Our consistent message to our youth has been that suicide is not the answer to the difficulties and challenges we face as a people. Bill C-7 will send a message in direct opposition to ours, quote. Committee witness Sarah Jama pointed out the absence of black and racialized viewpoints during the debate on Bill C-7. She noted the dangerous ramifications of those missing voices, given a history of medical coercion in the past, quote. I think it's quite obvious that there have only been a handful of black and racialized people to speak both in Parliament and in front of the Senate on this issue. It's ingrained in our history in Canada that disabled people and racialized people have been abused because our bodies are seen as different, and that connects race and our abilities. And to not center that in this conversation while we're passing this bill around euthanasia is dangerous. It's opening a can of worms that I think will be a regrettable part of our history here in Canada." Quote. Honourable Senators, we have a duty to hear these voices of the voiceless in this debate. We cannot just listen to white, upper-class university professors and legal experts who have the luxury of studying and pondering the esoteric points and finer nuances of these issues from the comfort of a leather chair in their ivory tower offices. Because in the real world, Gabrielle Peters is in her tiny apartment and Jonathan Marchand is in his long-term care room trying to figure out how to access care services with month-long waiting lists, services that will never come fast enough, if at all, to alleviate their suffering or isolation or pain. Meanwhile, the next Brian Sinclair will die in the next emergency room, ignored by medical staff who have made assumptions about him because of his race, while the homeless woman with a disability down the hall, who came in seeking treatment for her intolerable suffering, is offered access to assisted suicide instead. Some might find it so much easier to listen to a university professor or legal expert discussed in a very detached and theoretical way the nuances of human rights law than to listen to Sarah Jama in tears pleading with us to listen to the people this law will actually directly impact. Senators, we need to take a step back and put our privileged point of view aside. The voices of those who have spoken so strongly against Bill C-7 cannot be so easily discounted as some have tried to do on previous occasions with, oh, they're opposed because of their religion, or oh, they're just fundamentally against the concept of assisted dying anyway. Many of these people who oppose this bill are not religious, and many were not opposed to MAID or Bill C-14, but they view C-7 as a bridge too far, as a direct threat to the inherent value of their lives and to their equality rights under the law. Many of these people are traditional progressive allies, persons with disabilities, racialized communities, indigenous peoples, people living in poverty. These are the vulnerable people we as senators have a responsibility to protect here. I hope that you will. Thank you.